Welcome to Boris FX Live. Sponsored by Dell, Nvidia, and Intel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Boris FX. I am Ben Brownlee, and today we're going to be looking at Netflix's hugely stylish new stop motion animation film, Wendell and Wild, directed by Harry, Harry, uh, Henry Selick and co written, obviously by Jordan Peele. But today we're going to be talking with two artists who worked on the film uh, about how they used uh, Silhouette to help create the uh, VFX and also about their own paths to working in the industry. So I'm delighted to be joined in a moment by Justin Graham, VFX Paint and Roto Supervisor, and Veronica Hernandez, who is of course the Roto Paint, uh, uh, yeah, senior Roto Paint artist. Um, this is going to be a, a fascinating talk moderated by Boris Effect's uh, own Ross Shane. And also joining us is going to be Marco Paolini, Silhouette's product manager and designer. So strap in for some juicy VFX and Silhouette talk. And as ever, we are live and more than ever, I'm glad that we are. So if you're watching live, we have got some treats for you because here's how you can get involved. If you're watching on YouTube or on Boris FX Live, then we have a lovely little chat box that's just to the right hand side of the screen. So get your fingers tapping and ask all of your questions and comments uh, as soon as you can uh, to Justin, Veronica, Ross, and Marco. And if you are joining us on BorisFXLive.com, then you are in the running, or well, you could be in the running actually, to win some big prizes. So today we've got a couple of lovely prizes that you can win. All you have to do is go to borisfexlive.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and enter your email for a chance to win. And what could you win today? Well, we are giving away a one year subscription of Silhouette, which was used in Wendell and Wild. That's a $795 value. And also to one lucky winner, a one year subscription of the Boris Effects Suite. So that's everything that we make, including Silhouette, but also Sapphire, Continuum, Mocha Pro, and of course, Optics. So all you have to do to be in for a chance of winning that is go to borisfxlive.com, scroll to the bottom, and you will see the little window there, as well as full terms and conditions. Before we go any further, though, I would also like to say thank you to our sponsors today, uh, NVIDIA and Dell, uh, for uh, and Intel, of course, for helping us to, uh, to get these streams going. So thanks uh, very much to all three of those. Uh, without you, we couldn't do as smooth a stream as we're doing. Uh, and of course, a big shout out to the Precision 3260 Compact from Dell. It's tiny, teeny, ultra small form factor workstation for the most space constrained workspaces coming from Dell Technologies. All right. And if you aren't already doing so, you should follow us on all of the socials, but especially on YouTube, uh, because if you're uh, if you're not subscribed on YouTube at the moment, then, you know, what, what are you doing? Um, so hit that little hit that little subscribe button and you know, while you're at it, you might as well hit that thumbs up button as well and let other people know that we are streaming live. All right, so let's uh, let's get to it now. Um, I am going to be handing over to Ross Shane in just a moment, 
But uh, remember, do be sure to get in all of your questions into chat. I'll be uh, taking a look at those as we go through and piping in at good points. All right, without any further ado, hello, Ross, are you with us? Hey, Ben. Hey, that was a great falsetto. I loved, loved it when I, you uh, said that tiny. That was good. Oh, thank, uh, you, thank you very much. I've been, I've been practicing for my, uh, for, for my band. Yeah. I don't know. Well, thanks so much uh, for kicking this off, Ben. And I want to thank everyone who's joined us today. Um, this is a really, really exciting uh, session for us. I can speak for pretty much the entire team at Boris FX. Uh, one of the most enjoyable things about our jobs, you know, cr creating software is working with customers who are working on amazing projects. Uh, I've personally been a, a lifelong fan of stop motion. And uh, so I'm really excited about this particular session. Um, so yeah, so to, I'm just going to kick it off and really uh, bring in Justin and Veronica, as Ben mentioned. Um, Justin Graham, he was the, uh, the, the visual effects at Roto and Paint supervisor on the Wendell and Wild film, which we're going to be talking about. And that I think it just came out very recently uh, on Netflix. I, got, I had the, the pleasure of watching it uh, this week and really enjoyed it. Um, how are you, Justin? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for the nice intro. Yeah, let's talk about you for a second before we bring on Veronica. You know, I was checking out your IMD, uh, IMDb page, you know, a 28 feature film credits to your name. That's really, really cool. And I saw that you have- Is it that many? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, and I was really just impressed by the list of films that, you know, I know that you had experience at ILM and have worked on films like Minority Report and, or some of the Matrix films, a lot of the famous Marvel films. And of course, like a veteran of stop motion with your experience at Leica. Um, how did you get into the industry? Uh, I kind of took a real roundabout way of getting in. I actually was always into film and started out in film school at NYU Film School. Uh, but I also studied art history and ended up in San Francisco working for the film and video curator at the Museum of Modern Art, thinking I was going to be a professional film nerd and uh, program film festivals and write about film and just basically enjoy film professionally. Uh, but then in 1997 or 98, I heard that George Lucas was making a new Star Wars film. And I just said, I need to be a part of that. I got to do whatever I can to be a part of it. And so I just banged on every door I could and got uh, got my foot in the door at Skywalker Ranch. And fortunately, at Museum of Modern Art, a lot of my work was actually planning exhibitions in galleries. And we would use a lot of Photoshop to Photoshop in future artworks into the gallery to do layouts. So I learned Photoshop and that got me into the image library where we were doing photo resources for, for Star Wars episode one, still photo resources. And then from there, I just, they gave me a shot at ILM and I worked on Mission to Mars for two months and I just taught myself all the tools and to figure out how to do it. And I've just been teaching myself all along the way and just kind of rode the wave. That's uh, pretty fascinating. I mean, you had Photoshop, some Photoshop skills, but ha had you ever worked on animation or like, had you worked on video or, you know, what was your, or was it just kind of like uh, trial by fire? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of trial by fire. I mean, I had a lot of film and video production experience. Um, I had done in school a lot of stuff and then uh, on my own, I did some film and video stuff, just making short films. And then I just taught myself on the side After Effects and Shake and uh, they were using Commotion to do Paint Roto back in the day. And um, I kind of hit it off with the Paint Roto supervisor at ILM. And she said, if you can learn Commotion, I can give you a two month job. So I stayed up all night for about four days doing some paint work uh, in Commotion and showed her what I had. And she was like, mm, it's okay. <laughs> but she was kind enough to give me the gig. And uh, I kind of muscled through and did okay. That's very cool. I mean, I think that's for a lot of visual effects people who are a lot who are in the industry. You know, that I working for ILM is, uh, you know, it's sort of like the holy grail dream job, right? Yeah, it was definitely for me. I, you know, I was very hesitant about getting into 
film production because uh, I know it could be real trying and you have to really start at the bottom. But I just had my heart set on ILM, just seeing all the, you know, from when I was a kid, seeing all the uh, making of the original Star Wars trilogy. ILM, like you said, has always been the holy grail. And so I would do anything to get in there. And I tried to do whatever I could. Very cool. Yeah, I think for, I, you know, I could probably speak for probably almost everyone watching that, you know, seeing those Star Wars films, you know, inspired so many people just to get into this part of the industry. Um, so Justin, let's take a second. We're going we're gonna to look at your, uh, some of your early work, some of your reels, your, your, some shots you've worked on in the past. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, introduce Veronica Hernandez, who is uh, the senior Roto paint artist on Wendell and Wild. Hey, Hi. Veronica. Hello. Thanks so much for thanks so much for joining us. I know I, I've been in touch with uh, with both of you guys uh, it, it, over the past couple of years, but it's great to meet you in person or, or virtually. I know it's good to finally meet you guys. And and, and Veronica, you have uh, thirty nine films on your IMDb page, uh, and lots of very cool <laughs> projects. Uh, uh, you worked at Pacific Title Design uh, on films <laughs> like Spider Man, Men in Black. Um, yep. You've also have quite a lot of experience in stereoscopic visual effects, huh? Yeah, strangely enough, <laughs> sort of by accident. I mean, Coraline was the first film that uh, that I did in stereo, um, and yeah, did a lot of stereo after that. Um, I also have a weird way of getting into the business as well as Justin's like story there. If you want to hear it. Yeah, please. You know, we're, we're, we're dying to, to learn your, your I didn't history. Study, yeah, I didn't study film. I was always an artist and I was originally going to study art um, and took a detour and got a, a degree in anthropology. Um, and uh, don't ask me why. My ex-husband, um, my husband at the time was working in film and he worked at Pacific Title as a scanning and recording technician. And um, at the time I was struggling to find what I wanted to do, but also learned Photoshop at home. I had my own Wacom tablet that was ginormous. It was just huge back then. Um, and so he, he was, uh, put me in touch with people that were in the roto paint department. And he said, you know, you could do that. You're really good at painting. And so he uh, got me in touch with one of the girls there and they, I literally just went in after work um, like twice. They taught me Matador, which was the paint program at the time. Um, and he taught me a little bit of Unix, just enough to get by. Um, and I took to it uh, really quickly and uh, started as a dust buster at Pacific Title, um, which I don't think they even have dust busters anymore. <laughs> Um, and they were doing a lot of restoration there, which was really cool because the first movie that I ever worked on was uh, the restoration of Fantasia, which is really neat. Like we did a lot of restoration, like the Exorcist, the first Superman, um, Singing in the Rain, which was one of the coolest things to work on. Um, and uh, I just got better and better at paint. Um, Spider-Man, that Spider-Man shot that we had, we only had a few shots. That place that I worked at was kind of a 911 shop. Um, so we did a lot of trailers. And so I had to learn how to paint extremely fast, um, quick turnovers, like you have to do something in one day. Um, so I got really good at painting and just kind of honed my skills and um, could, by the end of working there, I think I worked there for about three years, I could really pretty much paint out anything. <laughs> um, so that's how I got into the business, which is really weird. And I got a, a really good education there, actually, because there was a lot of um, cameramen that were still doing the titles on cameras downstairs. And, um, and it was just a really weird, you know, like, I, I kind of got my film history through that place. And then subsequent places that I worked at. It's a very cool experience, I think, that you both probably had, which is you kind of came up right at this intersection of digital tools and, you know, old school, you know, uh, analog filmmaking, you know, so it's, exactly. it's, it's, 
definitely interesting. It's, it's actually sort of an area that I, I came up in as well as my colleague, Marco Pellini, who I'd like to bring into the conversation as well. You mentioned Matador and uh, yes. Marco and I both Matador. worked on a paint application called Matador that was made by a company called Par Parallax. Uh, how are you doing, Marco? Great to see you. Good, good, good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking forward to today's stream and everything that's gonna be shown. <laughs> so, so Marco is the uh, product designer and product manager of Silhouette uh, at Boris Fex. And um, yeah, he's definitely uh, an industry veteran and, you know, you know, it's always a, a pretty exciting, you know, to see what kind of features you guys are working on. So let's take a second yeah. and let's go back to uh, Brian, if you don't mind, uh, why don't we set up uh, Justin's, uh, your reel. I think it's a little older reel, probably too busy to update it, but, uh, <laughs> right? But uh, we'd love to watch it. And maybe then after, after we watch the reel, we could sort of talk through the reel and then we'll do the same for Veronica. Well, we want to take the high ground, okay? So let's okay. put the biggest gun up on that ridge. Gotcha. Where do you want to be? Where are you going? What are you talking about? I mean, you have me. a big gun. You are not the big gun. Tony, don't be oh, jealous. No, it's subtle, all the bells and whistles. Yeah, it's called being a badass. Fine. Awesome. Yeah, that's great reel. Uh, so, certainly so many iconic shots there, uh, Justin. Um, we'd love to, you know, tell us about some of those shots, you know, are, are there any that uh, bring back cringy memories of how difficult they were? Or, uh, you know, are there any shots that you can tell us about from your reel? How kind of uh, we're spoiled not. we are almost in stop motion. Yeah. 
because we have these beautiful motion control, clean plates and stuff in stop motion. Whereas on some of those live action stuff, like that Star Trek shot where it pushes in and they shot it with the actors in there, but they needed them to uh, turn, phase in. So we, they needed them painted out completely. And it's basically just a handheld shot. And they were kind of like, here you go, good luck. So it was basically a lot of like spline warping, uh, color correction, and it took probably couple weeks just to get that shot done. That was super painful. To, uh, to and similar with that. Oh. To rebuild the set. Yeah, to rebuild the, the set. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think they gave us like a couple frames of, of, of the set without the actors on, which had to be just completely rebuilt and animated. And so it was definitely a, a major Frankenstein type job. Uh, and that, that shot of Keanu Reeves doing the circle with the big rings on him at the end of the, the Matrix Reloaded. That was just pure hand paint. Just... Yeah, these are just this one, yeah, because this is sort of a low res uh, quick time, but those rigs were massive and the wires were covering everybody on the whole screen. It was basically just frame by frame painting. And that, that was definitely just Justin. Justin, I'm curious, do you, when you, when you receive a shot like this, do you have a particular process that you mentally go through as far as how to approach it and what, where you might start? Well, I always try and start with the easy stuff because there's always every shot like this is you, you never know how you're going to do it. <laughs> so it's like, you just try and like do what you know you can do and just pray that something will come to you. Some solution will happen. Um, and then you try a couple different things. And so basically treated the background, the set where the wires are covering the set and the rig is covering the set as one challenge and where it's covering Keanu's cloak as a separate challenge. So I think we did basically frame by frame paint to paint out the wires over the background. And then where it's covering his cloth, doing more like spline war tracking in, uh, clean plates of painted fabric and dissolving between one and the other. But usually every shot, and this is one of the things I like about doing this kind of paint roto is just about every time, if it's good enough shot, you just kind of go, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And you spend about an hour just kind of staring at your monitor, like with your head in your hands <laughs> and, until a solution <laughs> comes to you. And then it's usually just a hodgepodge of solutions, one after the other. It's like a puzzle. And you have to be quite meticulous about when you're evaluating the uh, frame, because sometimes you might start something and not, you might not notice that there's like a reflection or shadow, or you might have to kind of change the technique as you're going. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And what tools, uh, you know, across uh, throughout, you know, your, your sort of like evolution over the years what tools were the main you know your main tools of choice for uh for roto and paint well now it's silhouette definitely silhouette beats everybody in terms of roto paint um but over the years there's been i started out learning commotion which was kind of coming in just because on um, star wars episode one they needed just a million artists and they couldn't find enough machines to run matador and commotion was the sort of the low low cost Mac solution so they could just load up a whole team of artists with commotion. So, um, so I was definitely lucky in that sense. Like you said, we kind of came in at the, the convergence of film and, and digital. And that's when, you know, digital visual effects exploded and it created a lot of opportunities for people like me uh, to get their start. Uh, so I learned commotion and I used that. And then ILM developed their own paint roto tool, which is based on Matador and commotion, which they called uh, Commodore, because <laughs> it was based on com commotion and Matador. Uh, so I used that for a while, and then there's a couple other ones. There's sort of a dark time between commotion and silhouette, where people were trying to figure out what the next tool to use was, and then silhouette came along, and that was a total godsend in terms of getting this kind of work done. Right, like there wasn't. And then great I also paint. use in Shake, for example, there wasn't great paint tools, right? <laughs> No, I mean, it had the very basics, but, you know, you couldn't cache frames, you couldn't step through, 
you know, you couldn't use any of the tools that's like you have in Silhouette. Similar with Nuke, I tend to go back and forth between Silhouette and Nuke, um, but I do all my paint in Roto and Silhouette, and then sometimes bring that paint or Roto into Nuke and do some more uh, procedural stuff like spline warps and uh, keying if necessary and stuff like that. Justin, during during that time, we I, I was working at a facility and we had the the same the same issues where we were wishing we had a, a robust roto and paint solution and that's when we said let's you know we we had our connections and uh w you know with programmers um paul miller and perry kavalowitz uh who were working on uh previously had worked on elastic reality so we said you know what let's let's make something that we would like to use ourselves on our own shot so it it was that exact situation that you were talking about where there was not really something out there that we felt that we could use. So uh, I think we we had good timing and uh, were able to kind of slip into the market at the right time. Yeah, I remember when Silhouette came along, I was at, at Weta working on King Kong and they didn't have anything. So we were using Shake to do all our paint and it was such torture. And then they started beta testing Silhouette at, at, or started testing it out at Weta. And I was like, oh my God, give me that. I need that. So that definitely solved a lot of our problems. Very cool. Well, maybe we should uh, look at Veronica's reel now. And I think that it would be really interesting for, um, for the audience to learn a little bit about some of the challenges that are inherent in stop motion, paint and roto kind of projects. So. Uh, uh, Brian, if you could queue up Veronica's reel, that would be awesome. Very cool. Yay. Beautiful work. That's only nice. my recent reel. <laughs> so I, for yeah. the audience, you know, who might not know, I would mm -hmm. love to hear from you guys sort of like what some of the inherent things about stop motion, what are the most common challenges? And also if you could sort of maybe just let people know a little bit about how stop motion might have changed over the last 10 years with the introduction of these uh, 3D, 3D printing, you know, going from what might have been uh, claymation back in the old days to uh, this new technology. I would love to hear from hear about that. Uh, and I think, Veronica, in your the examples where you're showing your painting, painting out mm -hmm. the face, that might be a great place to sort of start, I guess. Yeah, so like in stop motion, I mean, the first movie I did was uh, Coraline and I didn't have, you know, I came from the same kind of background as Justin. I um, was doing a lot of, you know, X-Men and um, Narnia and, you know, all kinds of different films that uh, had raw live action, a lot of rig removal. 
And so coming into uh, Coraline, um, the things that really stood out were um, that sometimes they film on twos, which is like they kind of do a double frame um, every once in a while uh, to kind of make the animation a little bit smoother. Um, there was a lot of dust and dirt and things that kind of, you know, make a lot of noise or chatter in the movie uh, that we would have to clean up at first. It, like they've actually gotten better at cleaning the sets to to minimize that. But the other major thing was that um, you know on Nightmare Before Christmas uh, they replaced the heads when they would animate the, uh, the talking of the puppets. But on Coraline, what they did was they split the heads in, uh, split the faces in two. So um, they would have a top part for the eyes and then a top for, and then part for the mouth. And that would create a seam across the eyes and um, sometimes across the head and the neck. Um, it's all kind of, it's definitely uh, progressed and it, we can kind of get seams like on arms and legs now and um, all kinds of stuff. But uh, that was a major thing. I actually didn't do any seam removal on Coraline, but um, as time went on, um, seam removal, uh, it's gotten, it definitely is is more of a, a, a lot of paint work, <laughs> definitely. That was actually a thing that when I, when I was working before, <clears throat> I was kind of having a hard time finding a lot of paint jobs and I didn't have a lot of work. Um, and when I got to, uh, to Leica, um, I was amazed at the amount of paint work that I had to do on these films. And so it kind of felt like that was where I found my niche. Like I found that I'm actually doing more paint work than I've ever done uh, before, which was something that I never really thought would happen. I actually thought there was a time period that people were encouraging me to get into compositing because they were like, you know, the well's going to run dry on painting and um, you're not going to be able to really sustain that career. And, and actually, it's not true. It's, I have way more work than ever before. And another thing about the seam uh, removal and the, or the faces is that when they're switching out those faces and just the movement of that creates this chattering face, which is something that was in my reel. There was this you'll see on the before is that the face kind of does this fluttering um, movement. And uh, that is something that we definitely, um, everybody uses all kinds of different techniques um, like uh, morphing or, um, I forgot what Justin, <laughs> Justin said, but I do, it, I do it frame by frame. I just do a frame by frame paint uh, technique that I developed, I guess, or that I just, honed my skills um to do and um that's basically how i do it i don't um i just do a clean frame and then kind of track it by hand um throughout you know and try to keep the 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 original animation which is kind of hard you know like it's you do have to uh kind of bring back pieces of the face and to make sure that it looks the way that they want it to look you know you can't really change uh the face all that much but um yeah that's kind I of the basics that. i think <laughs> on something like this shot right here i think you have one, a yeah. great example of the face. yeah this right here um yeah this that's is pretty amazing products. to me it's pretty amazing to me that how consistent you you're able to paint frame by frame <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just very impressed nice because story. I know for me, for when I try to do like frame by frame touchouts, it's very obvious, you know, wh that each frame is a little bit different. Um, and that's just yeah. a skill that you've, you've developed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something that, um, I know it is, I kind of like what Justin was saying. It's, it's like different every time. It's like, you're figuring out a, a puzzle piece and, um, I definitely, if you saw me paint, which it would be, it kind of is really weird. And, and actually in silhouette, you know, there is that, um, we do do different passes in, in uh, stop motion as well. We do different lighting passes. So I'll have to work on the hero, uh, the hero pass. And then I have to uh, rebuild the paint um, on maybe two or three different passes after that. And what's cool about silhouette is that you can, you can watch it. It's almost like a recording of my painting. So it's, 
it's you'll see that it, I go back and forth, back and forth. It's it's a lot like hand animation. I'm always going back and forth to uh, make sure that I'm not creating more chatter, which that actually happens when you're painting. You create more chatter. Um, yeah, it's just something that I um, I don't know how I do it exactly. It's sort of like I go and I get in a zone and I, um, I've i had people actually ask me how I do things and I, I have a hard time explaining it because it is sort of an automatic pilot thing that, that happens when I start um, getting into it. But it is like a puzzle piece or a, um, a, a puzzle uh, trying to get that to work. Um, and then another thing sure. on my reel that you that was on there was the tiny little, they use tiny little rigs often in um, stop motion as well. They're like almost like tiny, um, uh, like pins. Um, and that was that is also something that I end up usually painting out frame by frame because there's no other way of doing it. Like we don't have, I mean, we might have a clean plate, but usually stuff goes over people's bodies and things. Yeah, those tiny little wire rigs. They're very tiny in real life, obviously, but. Um, Veronica, uh, yeah. I, I had a point and, and actually a question for you. Um, is for Silhouette, um, it's recording every single paint stroke mm -hmm. and change that you make so that later you can selectively choose those actions that have been previously recorded and repeat them over uh, various frames and use tracking to get it into the right place. Um, I wanted to make that point. But my question is, so you're painting along and uh, you're removing seams and you look at it and maybe you started with a clean plate and now you've got chatter uh, from mm -hmm. your paint. And, and you also have a lot of lighting changes in those shots with you know light being re uh, revealed, for instance, on the forehead. When, when you see that, you make your first pass and you were using a clean plate what do you what do you say to yourself and what do you do so you you've got the chatter you, you thought it was going to look good but now because you've painted on you know differences on various frames uh you've got that chattering and you need to get rid of it what, like what what would you then do to try and minimize that i'm i'm doing a shot right now that i'm like yeah it's you have to take it you have to have a lot of <coughs> sorry you have to have a lot of patience in this job and so uh, it's just one of those things you, yeah, get some coffee and you sit down and you take it frame by frame. You uh, start breaking it down. Um, okay, this this frame pops, so you're gonna fix it on that frame and then you go through it again. And um, you, you know, I try to take whatever clean frame I have and, and track it as far as I can. And it, it might be a couple of frames and then I have to, kind of adjust it again and I adjust it and then take it a few more frames and adjust it again. It's a lot of like kind of morphing the paint um, to fit onto whatever you need it to fit onto. And it's it it definitely is a thing where you just have to break it down piece by piece. I'm gonna fix this pop right now and then I'm gonna fix this lighting change. Um, you know, it's it's not a like a simple fix and like justin was saying it's different for every shot do you have pressure on the amount of time you have to complete a particular shot uh, or are you are you getting whatever time you need to make it look as perfect as it can be it depends like i mean um with stop motion you definitely have more time than i mean like i said when i when I began, and in a lot of visual effects houses, the uh, time framing is is much quicker, um, and that's how I learned to paint fast. But in in stop motion, we do have a longer amount of time, obviously, to do things. But we also, um, in order to get the film done by a certain uh, time, um, we have to to go through sequences, um, and so they will they will go like, okay, we're gonna get this sequence done um, in the next two weeks or whatever. And so they want you, they definitely aim for particular shots, but if something is more difficult, they obviously will give you more time to do it. But I mean, we always run into some shot that, that ends up lasting almost the length of the show because every person has touched it at some point, you know, like there's always a few dif difficult shots that have to be reworked or whatever. 
So. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, just for time's sake, we're already uh, over, over half uh, half hour into the program. So I thought that uh, we're, let's at, turn it back to Ben for a second, see if there are any questions from the chat that we can answer. And also, I, I'm sure everyone's kind of uh, waiting for a prize or two. So uh, Ben, are you there? <laughs> I am here. Hello, Ross. Hello, everyone. Yeah, this is this is absolutely fascinating stuff. I mean, I could um, happily just just listen to to these tales for for hours and hours on end, and we still have more time uh, to be able to to hear some more of this stuff. But um, if you're out there and you're enjoying what you're seeing so far, do us the little favor and the courtesy of just hitting that thumbs up button. Um, it, uh, you know, helps us out a lot and it is absolutely free. Um, yeah, we've still got a ton of stuff coming up uh, in the rest of the show, but I think we'll, we'll break stuff up now by giving away a little prize. Um, and how would one win a prize, I wonder? Hmm. Well, if you head over to borisfxlive.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page, you will see a lovely little entry form right there for you. So you just fill out the details there and you have a chance to win one of the prizes today. Full terms and conditions obviously are also on that page. So we have a, uh, a one year subscription of Silhouette that uh, we're going to be giving away in just a couple of seconds. But a little bit later on in the show, we are also going to be giving away a one year subscription of the Boris Effects Suite. So that is everything that we make, including Silhouette, Continuum, Sapphire, Mocha Pro and the lovely optics. All right. And that's going away to, uh, to one lucky winner as well. But let's focus in on the task at hand, which is me giving someone a one year subscription of Silhouette. We have drums rolling. We have the name coming up. That name is Lorena Sosa. Lorena Sosa, congratulations. You have just won a one year subscription to Silhouette. And guess what you had to do? All you had to do was go to borisfexlive.com and enter your name and email address. How easy is that? Um, other people are saying we should make this a little bit, uh, a little bit trickier and uh, and have a, a bigger question on there. I will take that under advisement for next stream. But if you want to win the Boris Fix suite, you know where to go. That's borisfixlive.com. All righty. Yeah, we are about halfway through at the moment, and we are going to be focusing and doubling our efforts uh, and looking at the, uh, the new Netflix animated film, Wendell and Wild, which Justin and Veronica both worked on. So without any further ado, let's head back over to Ross Shane. Thank you, Ben, and uh, congrats for, uh, for on the prize there. That's very cool. Uh, there's a couple questions from the chat before we get into, our, into the meat of this uh, session, which is gonna be talking about the Wendell and Wilde film from Netflix. Um, one question that came up in the chat was um, about Silhouette, actually. And uh, many people know that Silhouette was originally just a standalone application. And then in the last couple of years, we've come out with versions as a plugin. And curious if, if either of you have used Silhouette as a plugin in After Effects or in launching it directly from Nuke. Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, I've used it in Nuke. Uh, and it's pretty awesome. It's a pretty awesome benefit. It did kind of trip us up a little bit on Wendell and Wild because because of COVID and the pandemic, our whole pipeline got kind of thrown out of whack and everyone started working remotely instead of everyone working in-house. And we hired a bunch of new people. So people were working on their own with their own tools and using uh, this new plugin of Silhouette, which would not render on our farm because we hadn't had the time to license it and render that yet. So that caused us a few hiccups. And, of rendering problems, but the tool itself is awesome and it, it works really brilliantly. And I highly recommend the Nuke plugin for Silhouette. Cool. I mean, I think one of the cool things that Marco and the team, and Paul and the team uh, created with that plugin was the ability to, to bring in, uh, you know, to actually render the, uh, the Silhouette shapes directly into the Nuke interface, right? Marco, that was like 
a, a big ask from the customer base, I believe. Right. I mean, there's there's definitely uh, a number of workflows where native uh, Nuke shapes are necessary. Um, but you know, the benefit of the plugin on the flip side is that you know we get an exact one-to-one -one, uh, rendering uh, from Silhouette to Nuke um, when you use the plugin, and, and plus you have access to all the the nodes that Silhouette has from within the Nuke plugin. So it's kind of like having a compositor paint system roto system within another <laughs> compositor yeah sort of a pandora's box yeah. of uh, of uh, effects mm -hmm. tools <laughs> yeah it's great when you want to do those little quick paint fixes in a comp and especially if it's in the middle of the comp where you don't have to render out a pre-comp or render anything out you can just drop in that node and paint where you're at and you need to knock out some dust busting or little pins like we always get in stop motion or some sort of edge fix. It's you, can, you don't have to hand off a plate to another person. You just jump right in and paint it right there in silhouette within Nuke. So that's awesome. Cool. And there's one one other question from the chat, um, which is, in in these kind of projects which you both specialize in, the stop motion, you know, uh, roto and paint. How much of your re retouching is uh, painting versus compositing and uh, removing objects? Well, I got to say that, uh, you know, I just wanted to say, give a shout out because Veronica has superpowers with silhouette paint and some of you saw some of the work that she did. Uh, but every shot in these movies needs paint work. And there's about 2000 shots between 1500 and 2000 shots. And they all have seam removals, wire removals, rig removals, dust busting. Um, so we needed a team that got up to about 20 something people. And a lot of them are young, inexperienced people who we needed to get up to speed really quick and to get the years of experience that someone like Veronica has doesn't come quickly. So we built a lot of templates in Nuke where we would kind of go back and forth between Silhouette and Nuke where we could roto teams and the Nuke and then treat them that way with like in paint or medium blurs and then if necessary bring it back into Silhouette to paint some final touch up. Um, and to get rid of some of that chatter we have the uh, vector generator tools. We would generate vectors and then morph in various clean frames to reduce the chatter of the puppets. So it was definitely, everybody had their own methodology, uh, but it was a lot of back and forth between hand painting and procedural compositing type work. Do you, do you uh, use any proprietary uh, tools that any kind of special sauce that only only you have that that you know in in reference to stop motion uh like on the software side or are you using all off the shelf uh products it's mostly all off the shelf a lot of the custom stuff was sort of pipeline tools like integrating silhouette and nuke being able to like quickly grab a bunch of trackers and export them right into our pipeline and have them published and then be able to be able to see them in Nuke right away. That was most of our our special sauce was from the pipeline TD engineers developing that interface. Very cool. Well, let's let's take a look at um, the trailer to Wendell and Wild, and I think it will be interesting for everyone who's watching to kind of think in the back of your head about everything we've already talked about, you know, and how much uh, work. Yeah, is is going into these kinds of projects. So, uh, Brian, if you get a chance, we'd love to check out the uh, the Wendell in Wild video.
yeah well i'll give you guys that's uh nice. just pretty pretty amazing work and i yeah i mentioned i i i watched it uh i watched it again actually last night and uh, just to prepare and it's just the uh the richness and just like the the quality of of the animation and just like the, the composition just just really really cool film to watch uh, I just see in the chat someone gave a shout out to the X-ray specs, a punk band from the '80s. Uh, there's a really yeah, cool, uh, really cool documentary on Amazon about uh, X-ray specs. Uh, so oh, cool. check that out. Yeah, yeah, that's from the soundtrack of the, the oh, movie. Cool. And actually, all the cameras yeah, I mean, were named after all the cameras in, on the stages were named after bands that they wanted to use in the movie, like TV on the Radio and X-ray specs and Janelle Monae and. <laughs> I, I I wasn't sure if we we're going to talk about that, but yeah, it did definitely notice the Afro punk vibe of the mm -hmm. audio soundtrack it was really kind of cool. Yeah, Henry's a big fan. He even directed a video for Fishbone back in the day. And the main character is wearing a Fishbone shirt. Uh, mm -hmm. in the, in the, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> uh, so Justin, um, you know, you're the the a supervisor on the film, and I'm curious as to sort of it, especially since this film was uh, created by Netflix, it wasn't created, you know, it wasn't a Leica production, which we kind of associate with this kind of work. How did you get involved um, with Netflix and how did, you know, what was the process of kind of building up the team and everything? Well, it was a crazy process, that's for sure. I was at Leica for almost 10 years, about nine years. And then after Missing Link, there was a bit of a slow period. So I took, I stepped away and took some time off. And I was all ready to go back to Leica when our old visual effects supervisor from uh, Leica, Peter Vickery, went over to Wendell and Wild, and he convinced me to come join him. And I totally took a gamble on it. And one of the reasons I could go, I wanted to go there was because it was dog friendly and I could bring my dog to the studio every day. Uh, and it was also 15 minutes from my house, which was nice. Uh, and it was also a Henry Selleck production, which I knew would be interesting one way or the other. Uh, so we, I joined it, and originally the scope of the film was really small, really tiny. And you've seen the film, Ross, so you know that it gets pretty big towards the end. Um, so originally it was going to be all in camera, like 90% of the visual effects was going to be paint roto with a couple sky replacements. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. And originally they were going to outsource everything except for what we had a tiny in-house crew. Um, but then the pandemic hit and COVID hit and a lot of the, the effects vendors kind of shut down for a while. So Netflix, fortunately for us, like a slow period continued and I was able to get Veronica and our whole team of paint roto artists, uh, Ari and Gentry and Maria and Neil and a whole bunch of other people, Mandy. Um, and they all came and joined us remotely and we just started knocking out shots and it was just total fly by the seat of your pants like we didn't have a pipeline we didn't have anything it was all remote work we were uploading and downloading files uh and i was i was doing some, some all the shots in that reel or stuff that i worked on that were and those are finished comps that were done by our in-house comp team who are in-house but we're working remotely um with our visual effects supervisor, uh, Heather Abels, who was our environment supervisor, ended up being the visual effects supervisor, and Sonia Bouchard was our comp supervisor. So it was definitely total fly by the seat of your pants because of COVID, because of the scope of the production changed, because everything cha kept changing. There was forest fires and snowstorms, and the studio was shutting down every other week, and we were trying to get back up to speed. And so it was definitely a crazy process, but it was definitely one of the most rewarding uh, projects I've been on. Justin, uh, can, you, can you, can uh, you, I was just going to ask Justin about working remotely, if like the challenges with that, as far as uh, footage bandwidth, I mean, is, is, is the footage locally on your machine? Is it in the cloud? Uh, or, or is the software in the cloud? Or is the software just local? How do you, how did you uh, manage that? It was, it was definitely all of the above. Uh, we had an internal pipeline and a render farm, which uh, me and some of the artists were connected to, but a lot of the paint road artists were completely remote and we had a render wrangler uploading files. Uh, this awesome woman, Gail, was uploading files to them. They were working remotely. 
um, using software that was licensed through the Netflix Pulse server. Um, so they were using Silhouette and Nuke at home and then rendering locally, uploading to, to Aspera. Gale was downloading, we would publish it. It was a whole process. And we kept uh, updating the pipeline and as we went and everything was just changing constantly. But there were some people who were in-house like me, part-time, I was working on set of, uh, of visual effect, as uh, on-set supervisor and also working remotely on shots from home a couple of days a week, checking shots remotely, downloading shots, uploading shots, rendering to the farm. Some people were rendering to the farm locally. Some people were rendering to the farm remotely. Some people were rend rendering purely locally, remotely. It was a total hodgepodge Frankenstein production. And amazingly, it all came together in the end. Mm -hmm. Hey, Justin, you mentioned being on set. And I obviously being on set on a stop motion film is a lot different than being on set in a live action film. Um, yeah, the hours are better, that's for sure. Did you cross paths with the director? And you know how often? Oh, yeah. How how involved is uh, is is Selleck with every shot? Is <laughs> curious. He was he was very involved. He was in the studio every day. Um, I would meet with him just about every day, either remotely through a Zoom chat or in the, in the studio, in the screening room. And we would do a director review every day or at least a couple times a week. Um, and he would approve everything and look at everything and make comments. And he's very hands-on, very mm -hmm. direct. So in, in that regard, um, if you're working on a shot that might have a lot of effects you know it you you know that at what point is the decision made like that you know i think someone actually had a chat you know are you painting around volumetrics i know some of the shots have like smoke or atmospheric kind of effects and um do you kind of know that that particular shot is going to have more comp effects at some point uh it was definitely as it went along, originally there wasn't going to be any <laughs> uh, much volumetric visual effects, but then as the, the nature of the show evolved and the, the scope kind of exploded over time, a lot of that work was done by outside comp vendors and like um, Fuse FX did a lot of that work, Windmill Lane and Dublin. Uh, so a lot of it ended up being sent away and outsourced, but a lot of the paint road of the rig removals and wire removals were done by us in house before it was sent out. Um, so it was definitely a shifting canvas all the, the throughout the whole production about what was going to be in the movie, and a lot of stuff wasn't even figured out until the last couple months of the production. And uh, as far as like some of the shots that are on that reel. What was the hardest one, or, or you know, are there any that you sort of uh, think <laughs> about like, in your dreams? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were all tricky. There's one that I keep keep mentioning that isn't the hardest shot. It's the one where Manberg is feeding the demon in the jar, um, oh, right, and it right. wasn't it, it wasn't the hardest shot, but it's one of those where the animator filmed it with the 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 food kind of covering the demon and falling in front of him. They're bacon bits, right? Uh, yeah, they're bacon bits. <laughs> um, so then they looked at it, and Henry has to approve everything before it, it can be worked on in post production. So and before the stages can call it stage complete. Um, and Henry didn't like the fact that the food was covering the demon and falling in front of him. Uh, so I was working remotely that day from home, and they called me up and said, "Henry wants to see if you can paint this out." and see it in director review to approve it. We need to get it approved today. And the director review was about an hour away. And I looked at it and with the moving head of the demon and the scratches on the jar and the light reflections, I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, but I opened silhouette and I just, and Henry doesn't like to see anything half baked. He wants it to look like it's done or else it kind of throws him off and he can't approve it. And it would have meant setting the stages back another day if they had to reshoot it. So I just rolled up my sleeves and dug in and painted it in about an hour and sent it into the farm and rendered it. And Henry loved it. So that was definitely one that was like, 
Uh, and I couldn't have done it without Silhouette because there's no other tool that would have allowed me to paint that quickly. When you uh, when you're viewing it for approval, are you uh, are you looking at it on a large screen? At, yeah, at Henry any point? Look, well, in the screening room, we had a big 4K uh, monitor that Henry would look at everything on. But mostly we were just checking stuff on our own monitors. We had, you know, BenQ color corrected monitors that we would just kind of check it on our own, publish it, send it to director view and hope for the best. Yeah, it's like sometimes when, when you get into projection and you see something really large, it's like, ooh, not as good as it looked on my screen, you know? Yeah, yeah, I was definitely, we had a, a staff screening at OMSI, which is the science museum here, and they have this big IMAX screen and they showed it to us for the first time in its finished uh, state. And I was biting my nails knowing how much work was done on this shot, but it ended up looking beautiful. I was super happy. Oh, and this was a tricky one because this was one where I was on set supervising and they showed me the, the blocking for this. And I was like, those rigs are going over those characters in the background. Uh, can you guys shoot that as a second pass? And they were like, oh yeah, we'll shoot those as a second pass and we'll put a green card back there. And then they did a rehearsal and they were like, yeah, we can't actually shoot as a separate pass. We don't have time. So I was like, all right, well, can you at least move the rigs? And they're like, oh yeah, we can totally move the rigs. And then when they started shooting it, they're like, yeah, we can't move the rigs. And then I was like, well, can you at least shoot an alternate exposure where you move the rig over a little bit so we can get, see the faces behind it? They're like, oh yeah, we can do that. And then I started filming it that night and I came in the next morning and they're like, yeah, we didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that so looks like a very challenging like, shot. Looks very challenging. Yeah, this was uh, done by one of our artists, Gentry Davidson, and he did the full comp, took out the green screen, and they did shoot us a motion controlled clean plate with the, the background characters in there. And then they shot us another clean plate with the background characters out, with the green screen in. And then they shot us another motion controlled <laughs> clean plate with the set rebuilt. So we did have a lot of material to work with, but it was definitely this one. It's definitely a challenge. And it seems to me that uh, if there's any small imperfection just for the nature of the way we watch these kinds of films, that maybe they're more perceptible, I mean, you know, more noticeable uh, in a stop well, motion. The, so everything has to be. Well, the funny thing is Henry really loves stop motion and he loves the imperfections of stop motion. And I think in his heart of hearts, he would probably like us to keep the rigs in. <laughs> Uh, it's so it was, the challenge on this show is finding out how much imperfection to leave and how much to take out. Because sometimes if it was too smooth and too clean, he would think, oh, it doesn't look like stop motion anymore. So so he was always trying to figure out how much dust busting to do. Because, you know, when they're animating on set, the, the animator will leave fingerprints and dust and little things will get jostled around. So we were constantly fixing, but trying to determine how much to fix and also how, much, how to get it all done within the amount of time we had. And this shot coming up right here is a good example because the seams we on on all the Leica films, the seams were removed completely. But Henry liked the seams and wanted to leave them in, except he didn't like the actual seams most of the time. So we actually had to fix the seams and make them look better. And that was a challenge. So they're digital it's seams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were just uh, enhanced scenes digitally. And, and Veronica, for you, or is there a particular <laughs> shot that, um, you know, that you're still uh, seeing in your dreams? <laughs> it, it's like, it's kind of like what Justin was saying, the ones that are, that are the most annoying are, are like not even really that hard. Like there was one with Raul where um, he's on the, he's, um, doing his chalk painting, I think it's chalk painting. But the camera turns like it 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 turns and I think zooms in or zooms out. I can't remember. What it was I think it was zooming out. And when any, anything is turning like that, um, it's just very hard to paint. And I don't even remember what we were painting on it actually, but it it just was not. Mm -hmm. It just was working. I think it was, and it was a pretty long shot too. When things are usually our shots are average around 100 frames, maybe 150 or something, but I think that one was a 400 frame shot. 
which is Justin knows what it is. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a brutal one. That was definitely one that was it was highlighting this beautiful painting that the character Raul was doing. Uh, but it was a really slow, long pullout, and there was all these imperfections where you could see the animator was like slightly jostling, and there was dust, little dust bunnies popping on and off. So trying to get that to work took a huge amount of effort, and also yeah. getting it through the approval pipeline because Henry would approve everything, but then we'd have a QC process where the director of photography would look at it, our visual effects supervisor would look at it, the editors would look at it. And everybody would just start pointing out little imperfections that they didn't like. And so then you'd have to go back in and try and retouch it up. And definitely the seam situation was hard on this. Like it, it's definitely harder to keep the seams in than it was to paint them out. So we had to keep the seams look consistent through the whole frame, you know, like, and that was just, it was a challenge. It, we all kind of, it was something different, something new that we all, had not really done before. So everybody had a little bit different technique, but it wasn't as easy as it would seem. Like, oh, let's just keep the seams in. And actually it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, it was also a great deal of look development with Henry trying to get the seams to look exactly the way he wanted them to look. And it mm -hmm. took about a couple weeks of various methodologies and finally we figured it out and he, he was happy in the end. Very cool. Uh, I had a question for you looking at some of these shots. I'm just kind of curious, you know, there's a, a real combination or of uh, some extreme close ups and some very wide shots. And I also know that there's different scales of the actual puppets. You know, I, I'm just curious if the different scales of these rigs or, you know, or what's harder, you know, a close up, which you might a close up or a real, you know, a, a extreme, you know, distance shot. Uh, I think it depends. The, the close ups are definitely hard because you're so focused on the character's face and the hero character's face. Because a lot of the, the distance shots, the long shots, we wouldn't have to worry about as much cosmetic cleanup, uh, if at all. But yeah, when you see the hero's face super close up, you want to have it look really good. So those were definitely challenging. And sometimes you get rigs in the hair and on the back of their clothes and in in the fine details of their wardrobe and and intermingling with the set. So yeah, the close-ups are probably harder. How long of a sequence uh, is able to be shot within a, a normal uh, production day? Well, I think they were shooting for 2000 frames a week which is uh, for between 2,000 and 2,400 frames, which at 24 frames a second is 10 seconds <laughs> per week. So you've been doing this for uh, a while. Yeah. Yeah, it takes years to make these stop motion mixed pictures. I was on Wendell and Wild for almost three years. Wow. It's commitment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is it is really rewarding though to be part of an animation studio where you're working on the whole movie and you get to see it mm -hmm. from beginning to end as opposed to working sometimes in visual effects you don't even know what you're working on you get like some a couple of shots of a movie and you're like i have no idea what this movie is about or anything and you do it and then a year later it comes out and you're like oh yeah i worked on that uh but working on like our one one wild it's much more like a part of the whole uh process um it's much more rewarding than um yeah working on something really quickly for a couple months cool uh, i i think we might have uh, talked about this either earlier or maybe yesterday when we just met briefly but i'm just kind of curious a little bit about like the animating on twos or threes you know sort of like the nature of this kind of work and as a compositor, you know, traditionally you're, we're working on every frame, you know, it's frame, frame by frame by frame. So, so that um, tweening between keyframes, for example, is relatively makes sense. But uh, I'm just kind of curious as to how the duplicate frames might affect your work. When, Does that make it sense? definitely affects it when, when you're doing a roto, it's definitely affects it drastically. 
And I actually learned that um, my first experience with stop motion was at ILM. They decided they wanted to take on stereo conversion uh, and they took on Nightmare Before Christmas to do a stereo conversion of Nightmare Before Christmas, which as turned out was way harder than anyone had anticipated. So they dragged in every paint roto artist in California into the show, including me. Uh, and basically everything had to be rotoscoped uh, to, to separate it out into the left and the right eye. Uh, so I was rotoing everything and you, you're used to doing tweens, like doing it on fives, but when it animates on twos and sometimes threes, there's no in-between sensibility. So you have to roto every frame and do hold frames and it gets to be really tedious and tricky. So that's probably where the biggest problem is. And uh, you mentioned stereo. I mean, I know that Silhouette was one of the first uh, tools to kind of add that stereo paint. Um, how much mm -hmm. uh, stereo stuff have you done with the Silhouette uh, interface? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, Wendell and Wild wasn't stereo, uh, yeah, which right. was just real saving grace. Uh, but it like mm -hmm. uh, everything was native stereo where they would shoot with left and the right eye. And we'd have to paint left and right eye. So the silhouette tools to paint uh, with a stereo offset were a real lifesaver and really helped us out yeah. a lot because painting real fine detailed edges gets super tricky in 3D because something you can't really see on your monitor very well can shows up big time on the big screen when you're looking at it in stereo. Right. Yeah, it was right. a lifesaver. Uh, Veronica, can you, can you repeat that? It was a lifesaver. I mean, it, it like, I don't know how we would have done it otherwise. I don't like, it's, it's pretty tricky to not, I mean, to have to paint the painting side by side was, was perfect. Um, and then there were times where stuff doesn't line up and I would have to paint each eye separately, but it was great that I could see both the both sides at the same time so I can line it up. And it was, you know, it was great. Like silhouette was perfect for it, but Thankfully, I don't think we're, I mean, hopefully we won't be doing any more stereo films. That's what I hope. Because it is, it does take uh, twice as long to do it. I don't know. Now that Avatar 2 is if coming out, everyone's going to want three. It's, it's <laughs> possible. It, we'll see if there's a, a, a third wave of, uh, of stereo. A resurgence. <laughs> I was going to ask if you're animating on uh, twos, are you painting on a compressed sequence and then re-expanding it or are you are you duplicating your paint every other frame yeah you just duplicate it like it's not painting painting with twos is not as hard as yeah rotoscoping i mean i'm just duplicating it it's not it doesn't affect me much um on the way the way that i work but yeah it's not um too hard yeah, we didn't get too tricky with retiming tools to match the frame holds of the, we just basically worked on the native frames and dealt with the, the, the tricky hold frames animation. And it, most most shots were uh, animated on ones. It's only occasionally you get weird hold frames. Cool guys. Um... Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, again, it's just totally fascinating. I'm sure everyone is kind of realizing how much work goes behind these films. You know, I can't keep saying, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of people sort of think that, uh, you know, there's, there's automated tools to fix these kinds of things or with CGI, obviously, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's just really impressive how much, uh, and, and I can appreciate the years of experience that you both have to be able to, to take on these challenges because they're not just they're not simple shots um and i can i can say that from my own experience um and i think at like this point justin mentioned it yeah. before that we you know like we we end up touching almost all of the film like the roto paint department does we we end up working throughout the whole film usually because it's just you need it for the faces um there's usually rigs and something so it's like you know we end up being a big part of that film. Yeah, it's it's very cool stuff. Um, at this point, let's uh, turn it back to Ben, our host, or uh, for a second. I think we might have another prize and maybe some more questions. 
we we've got a ton of questions yeah um i might save some of these for for later because i know we've got an, another section after this um but i think i mean there's 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 so there's so many good good ones that i want to get to uh and i'm going to get to zero of them um actually no one one of them here i think and i think you've you've answered some of this already but just go back to to the sort of aesthetic that, that Wendell and Wilde has um you know it sort of em embraced that that stop motion aesthetic you talked already a little bit you know about the seams being visible um and the motion as well is you know it, it's consciously jerky it's not you know that it's not the the sort of smooth 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 animation that uh, we've we've sort of got used to seeing with uh with stop motion now my question is how much extra work actually went in to getting that imperfectly perfect or perfectly <laughs> imperfect aesthetic as opposed to uh you know just just uh touching everything up uh, 100% um if we start with veronica maybe i don't know like i don't know how to answer that <laughs> <laughs> i mean it just it, it's just keeping the you're just keeping what they already have done. I mean, like, it's going to look a little bit jerky the way that they animate. And we try to just keep it that way. Like, you know, uh, you know, we're going to paint a little bit of touch up in the face and everything, but we're going to keep the, the same movement that, that, that the puppets do. So it's not, I don't know if it's like a lot of work that to keep that look, I could be wrong. Maybe Justin can talk about it. Yeah. No, Wendell and Wild is Wendell and Wild is actually uh, it was tricky, like I said, trying to figure out how much to leave in. And so there was that was basically more of the approval process, getting it to a point where you didn't want to work on it too much so you could get it in front of Henry and then have him be happy with it. So it was always trying to do that dance. Uh, but in terms of doing the actual work, it was harder at like a, every director has their own aesthetic and at Leica they definitely liked things polished on certain shows and they wanted it to look you know like a like it was super polished and you know you always get cloth chatter you know shooting it frame by frame everything chatters faces chatter so that was a lot more work in terms of smoothing out and sometimes you'd have to do like these two and a half d cloth sims you know in nuke to, to smooth everything out and dust bust everything like crazy Although they were probably a little more careful on set shooting, Wendell and Wild was definitely a little rough and tumble on set. You know, and we were trying to get this movie done during the pandemic, so there may have been a little bit more dust to paint out on Wendell and Wild. Uh, but it was Henry's uh, aesthetic of his love of the the tactile stop motion was definitely made a lot of things forgiving. Excellent. No, no, thanks. Thanks both of you. I mean, I've, I've got a lot more questions, but I think we'll, we'll come to those at the end of the, uh, the next part. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, you're watching Boris FX live, obviously, uh, and there's still time to get in your questions. If you, uh, just want to type in like many other people have done already, uh, in the chat window, either in YouTube or on the Boris Effects live.com page. And there is, of course, another reason why you might want to head over to BorisFXLive.com. That is, of course, our prizes. Uh, if you go to BorisFXLive.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll find a lovely little box there where you enter your name and email address and you have a chance to win one of our big prizes today. Uh, we've already given away a, a year's subscription to Silhouette. And coming up a little bit later, we are going to be giving away the Boris Effects Suite. Yes, a one-year subscription to everything that we make at Boris Effects, including Silhouette, that we are going to see in just a moment. Uh, but also, obviously, Sapphire, Continuum, Mocha Pro, and Optics. So that's going away to one lucky winner. If you are watching on YouTube, now is the perfect time to hit that little thumbs up button. Look at that, it's like this, except we want it to go pling um and uh yeah it's that's what you do on youtube you hit the thumbs up button you get a little uh a little flash of fireworks and 
everyone is happy for the rest of the day. All right, we are uh, we're going to head back over to uh, to Ross, Marco, Justin, and Veronica. But uh, yes, please keep your questions coming. We will answer those very shortly. All right, heading over to Ross. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, and again, for those of you who are watching, you know, we're talking about Wendell and Wilde, which is this new uh, stop motion show on uh, film on, on Netflix, and uh, it's really enjoyable to, to check out. So at this point, I think, um, Justin, I think we, we're going to look at a little bit of silhouette. And for some some of you who are on the stream, you know, watching, you, you, you've heard us talking about silhouette. And if you haven't seen it, I think it would be kind of interesting just to bring up the interface and maybe, uh, you know, anything you kind of want to share about how you use silhouette would be uh, really interesting to us. Sounds good. So this is actually, uh, you know, we talked about Veronica does all her scenes with hand paint, but we also have procedural ways of doing it, which is basically with a lot of roto. Um, and I think you can see here, there's some roto shapes. So basically we would roto the seam itself. And this may look fine to you, but it wasn't quite what Henry was looking for. So we would roto the shapes and we would do these holdouts. And you could see I would need to treat the, the shadowed area versus the highlighted area separately. So I did separate holdouts. Um, and then we would export those to Nuke uh, just by selecting them. And then on file, export Nuke 9 shapes. And then we're, we could open those right up into Nuke. And then we would do various using in paints or medium blurs. We would knock out the, the original scene shape and then draw back in a new one using the spline with a nice, pretty, perfect one. So as you can see here, these are just some low res quick times, but that's basically what we were doing. And this is probably seems subtle, but it was very important to our director that these scenes looked just the way he wanted them to. Uh, and then of course we used the paint tools pretty drastically. It looks like the, uh, the seams the seam is there, but there's no space in the seam. Was that the kind of the gist of it? Yeah, exactly. Some of the some of the small 3D printed faces, um, the seams would be too large, and sometimes and all these faces on Wemble and Wild were hand painted, so sometimes you'd get all these little imperfections with little drips of paint or scratches, or they just wouldn't look very uh, aesthetically appealing. So we were just trying to replace them with perfect looking seams that it, in a perfect world would have been 3D printed perfectly. Uh, I'm curious, uh, Justin, now you, you probably, well, I guess you started three years ago and you, you were not using Silhouette 2022, which came out this year. I'm just curious if you've, uh, if you've had a chance to play with the in-paint uh, feature that came out this year. Uh, I haven't in Silhouette. I've definitely used it in the in-paint feature in Nuke, and it's uh, it's definitely a miracle. Yeah, well, I think it's a really, a really powerful new feature in Silhouette. And in fact, Ben, ben our host, has uh, done a, a pretty cool tutorial that you can find online where it's uh, shape-driven in uh, in-paint in Silhouette. It's one of the one of the top new features. Nice. Yeah, a lot of our work was just basically grabbing different frames. This is that shot I was talking about. So grabbing different frames and doing the align tool. And I'm going to use my preset here to do a little bit of trickery. But this is basically what we were doing on every shot, frame by frame, painting out these things. In addition, I'm doing little dust busting on these little little pills and hairs and little creases in the neck. Fortunately, Manberg's face was craggy enough. We didn't need to touch his seams. It was mostly the, the characters with the smooth faces like Sister Helly that we needed to touch up the seams for. 
uh, but yeah, that's basically it. I used Roto and Cologne frame by frame. And the, the other Justin, thing about you, Silhouette. You, Justin, I was going to ask you on the uh, uh, on your painting and your presets, do you, when, when you're doing that kind of uh, those paint outs of certain areas, do you typically have presets for uh, pulling in different frames throughout the sequence? Or are you just kind of manually just yeah. choosing different frames as you go? It depends on the shot. Sometimes we'll just do it all manually and won't even use presets. Um, but there are a couple of shots where I would I knew that I would want to pull from a specific different frame, but I would also want to pull from the same frame and do like an offset clone. So I would set a preset so I could toggle back and forth and just paint a little bit from the, from the same frame and then grab from a, a different frame quickly. Um, nice. and one of the nice things about Silhouette is you can do, you can render this paint only. So this represents just my painted area, which makes uh, a quick pre-multiplied render. So I can render this locally and then bring it into Nuke and over it and just drop it into my stream wherever I wanted to. Uh, so that's a really nice feature. And another hey, nice hey, feature is <clears throat> because, mind, yeah. Sorry, do you mind zooming into the image a little bit? So I think some people in the chat were curious. Thank you. So this is before and after. Um, and another nice thing, I think, Marco, you had kind of touched on it a little bit, was the rebuild function in Paint. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have any plates to show you, but uh, one of the nice things about stop motion is because everything is shot uh, frame by frame and with motion controlled cameras, they can shoot different passes for us. <clears throat> so something with a blue screen, they'll actually shoot a separate pass at the same time, alternate frames where they'll turn off the foreground lights and light the blue screen to help with the composite. Uh, so if you're painting in silhouette on one on the hero beauty animation, you can rebuild your paint on the on the uh, blue screen pass. So it, you can knock out the rigs on both passes and then the composite will have those, uh, which is definitely one of the tricky things that was hard to explain to outsource vendors when we were getting them to do paint roto work because they had never heard of this capability of rebuilding paint for separate passes. They had no idea what we were talking about, but for me and Veronica and, 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 and <clears throat> all the other people on the team. And just to clarify on the rebuild, the, the rebuild, since since there's a record of every every stroke and every brush on every frame, um, essentially what's happening then when you do a rebuild is that you swap out your source image for a new source image, which may have entirely different lighting, but mm -hmm. everything's registered in the exact same location so that when the rebuild happens, that the exact same strokes then work on the new shot without any alterations other than physically going through the process. So it's like mm -hmm. watching somebody paint as fast as you can every single one of those strokes on every single frame. Yeah. And it also paints in the order that you, it repaints and rebuilds in the order that you painted. So it, it perfectly recreates right. what you've just done, which was a great addition to the tool, yeah. which I think I was pulling my hair out one day, emailing Marco years ago asking for and you turn that around super quick. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good point because we, we do what we think is right and uh, mm -hmm. artists come back with, it's pretty good, but if you could just do this, it would be even better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's, we know what it's like to have to be pushing a shot out quickly. So when, whenever possible, we try and integrate those changes as quickly as possible. Yeah, and you guys have been awesome about that. So thank you. Uh, on that note, I'm curious, uh, you know, as both of you are longtime Silhouette users, uh, are there any feature requests or, you know, are there any, er any areas that you'd like to see the team uh, looking into that would make your life easier? Yeah. Veronica, you got anything? <clears throat> I always get used to like whatever is the last version of Silhouette, I always get attached to it. So like I was attached to 7.5 for the longest time and then I finally worked <laughs> on 2020 on Wendell and Wild. Now I'm attached to 2020 and I have to like 
force myself to use the newer version. But no, I, I actually love, I mean, now thinking back on the way things were before, I love the way it works now. Um, yeah, that I use that rebuild feature so much and it has really improved. Uh, I really like, I haven't had it. You know, sometimes it won't rebuild completely correctly, like depending on the lighting, but uh, it usually works pretty, it pr works pretty fast, which is amazing. Um, it's that one we use a lot. Um, I can't think of anything right now, but I, <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll think about it. No worries, no worries. <laughs> and how about tracking? Uh, just, you know, I'm curious as to, uh, and maybe this might be more uh, Justin than Veronica, uh, you know, how much tracking are you, are you doing in Silhouette? Are you using the Mocha Tracker? Yeah. Have you Mocha played with tracker. Power Mesh yet? Just curious. Have not played with Power Mesh, no. But we use Mocha Tracker constantly. I think even in this shot that I was showing with Raul's face, get get a good track on those seams it saves us a lot of time uh so yeah we definitely use the tracker and use point trackers constantly or at least i do um we use and i'm lot. constantly and one of the great things about silhouette is being able to convert roto into trackers sometimes i'll roto stuff by hand and then but i want to use specific points on that roto shape as trackers in nuke and i can just select those points and turn them into point trackers and export them right into nuke and so that's that's a really awesome feature. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Excellent. Well, at this point, uh, let's bring back Ben and see if there's any more questions from the chat, uh, as well as it might be getting close to grand prize time. Muted, Ben. Yep. Do you, know, do you know why I was muted? Because last time I wasn't muted, I, I did a huge cough directly into the microphone and people didn't like that very much. Um, so, yeah, so let's just watch my lips flapping around for 20 seconds. Um, no, what I was saying is that I've got another couple of a couple of questions before we uh, before we get off to the, the grand prize, which is obviously my favorite, favorite bit of the show. Um, the first one's to Veronica again, um, and a few people have said this. Can you show off your faces, please? They've noticed you've got what? something in the background. This? Okay. <laughs> Those <Yeah>. little things. <laughs> this is what they gave us as a crew grip, one of the crew gifts on Wendell and Wild. Um, they are faces. We all get different faces. Um, I happen to get the uh, Underworld... Wendell and Wild, you can see they're more of the flat faces, which is very specific in the movie that they're, they're flat when they're in the underworld, they're more uh, geometric, more Picasso-esque, and then when they get in the real world, they kind of get fatter. And then um, I have, oh, and then this shows how uh, there's the bottom part of the faces, and uh, the top part, I don't want to take it off, um, but there's this cat. Ooh, I'm kind of afraid to move them, but they are magnetically uh, on there. But you can see how small they are. They're very small, very delicate. Um, this is one of the awesome gifts that they gave us on Wendell and Wild in a nice glass case. Nice. Oh, very, very cool. <laughs> it says, like, it says Wendell and Wild on the back. Nice. It's one of the perks. Very cool. Working in stop motion. We've gotten a few for, from Leica as well. We have some faces from, uh, Justin has faces from Paranorman that we got as well. They Ooh. work the same way with the magnet. And this is what it looks like on set. Every animator has a tray like this, but usually there's about a couple hundred of these faces that they will uh, go through frame by frame as they animate and swapping out the little bottom halves of their faces as Veronica was just showing you. It's so cool because it's such a, the medium, you know, there's so many aspects of craft and artwork in the, in the medium that runs through almost every aspect of this whole thing. So it's, it's just so cool. It is really cool. It's one of the coolest thing about it is to go on set and see how tiny everything is. 
Um, or like it varies, definitely varies at times. Sometimes they make larger scale uh, versions of things and tiny versions of things. And it, yeah, it gives you a greater perspective. I mean, cause we're zooming in all the time so we can see everything. But when you go on set and you see the actual size of it, you you have a greater, you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'm not gonna be mad about the dust and the dirt and the, you know, the little imperfections because you realize that they're, they're working with very tiny little things. And so it's easy for them to have uh, imperfections, so. Can you give yeah, us that, an idea that, of uh, like how how long the pre-production uh, was on the on the film as as far as getting all the characters ready, all the models? Is was that uh, quite an extensive process? Uh, I don't think either of us were there for that. I actually started the same day they started shooting, um, and that was when uh, the, I was the second visual effects person to join the show. Um, but I think Henry had a few years before that of doing story development and character design. Um, so it was definitely a long, lengthy process. And they're all like that. Like they all uh, are usually a pretty long um, pre-production before it even goes, yeah, before they even start shooting. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of tests too. There's a lot, there's a, time, a long period of time where they're doing just tests to make sure that they can, you know, at least at Leica, that's how they do things. You know, they have to test how uh, the horse is going to walk or something like that, you know, like, and so there's a lot of testing way before they're even doing the actual shoot. Yeah, I think at Leica, during the entire production of one show, another show will be in pre-production and development mm -hmm. throughout the entire course of while we're shooting one, they're designing the next one. Yeah. So oh, I've got one final question uh, for the both of you then. Um, and this is sort of speaking to, you know, the, um, the, the fact that you're both industry veterans. Um, and I, I think this is, this is something that, that comes up a lot. But like uh, over the years, how have your techniques changed um, in relation to the, um, you know, the tasks that you're doing? I mean, obviously the software's changed and, and developed, but you know, what about what about the, the base, the base techniques? So if we can start with Justin on that. Well, I think uh, I've definitely kind of geared myself towards doing things more procedurally over the years. Um, when I started out, I was working more just framing frame by frame hand painting. Um, but as the shots got more and more challenging, and the, the compositing tools got more and more accessible, I have started to, you know, what Veronica would probably think is cheating. <laughs> by using <laughs> like vector distort vector maps to distort clean frames on their characters faces uh and stuff like that spline warps tracking mocha tracking uh, i've definitely kind of tried to grab every tool that's out there to use um and it's always important to keep learning and i keep learning something new every day veronica how, how does that match up with uh with your experience um, yeah, learning I'm, every day, obviously. <laughs> I'm kind of a weird old school, you know, like I've kept my techniques pretty much the same. Um, <laughs> I do, learn, I mean, I was like, I do know how to do all things procedurally. I do. Like, I <laughs> tend to not use them. Like, my brain doesn't work like that. Like, my brain just does this kind of, uh, it, like I said, it's easier for me to just do it the way that I've always done it, um, which is, is the hard way. It's the hard way for sure. And I totally know that that is, I'm kind of an offline person, you know, I'm like a, an off liar. I don't know what to say, to her, but there's probably like maybe a few of us out there. Maybe there's about five of us that still do it. I have no idea. Like, but um, if you're out there, you know, you're not alone, but um, I definitely try to push myself to do more procedural things. And it's, it, you know, the painting and everything has gotten so much better. I mean, definitely, maybe that was half my reason why I did it the way I did it was because our, you know, the the software was not that great when I started out. So um, I just adapted my way of painting to that situation. You know, it still goes on today, unfortunately. <laughs> And okay, fine, final question. 
where can people see Wendell and Wild? On Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> on Netflix. Right now. There we log go. Into Netflix. As soon as you log out of this chat, log into Netflix. Turn it on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly no it's 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 a really it's a really great film i thoroughly enjoyed it i th I, I loved the aesthetic I, I yeah i loved i loved everything about it um oh, thank, thank you I, I just want to say no thank thank you and thanks thanks both of you for uh for joining us on on boris effects live it's it's been an absolute pleasure just to uh to to listen to both of you um and i i hope you'll uh, you'll be back on the uh on the next project in three yeah. years time <laughs> or more <laughs> yeah you never know or more or more yeah okay thanks thanks justin thanks veronica and thank, thank you, you also to uh to ross and marco obviously for uh, being there thanks everyone there's the big we'll do the big brady bunch wave there we go <laughs> and now i get to give away stuff <laughs> if you want. there we go right like I said, when my camera was muted, oh, sorry, my mic was muted. Um, giving away stuff is my favorite part. It's my lifeblood. Um, it's why I'm a very bad businessman and I'm never put in charge of that sort of stuff. So what are we doing? We're giving away the Boris Effects suite to one lucky viewer. How did they win? They went to BorisFXLive.com. That's how they did it. And you can do that as well next time. But enough of that. Roll some drums. We've got drums rolling. We have got a winner, and our winner is Sean Bartles. Sean Bartles, congratulations, Sean. You have won the one-year subscription to the Boris Effect Suite. Uh, everyone in the chat, give a big thumbs up to Sean, um, to Sean and all of our winners today. Uh, we will be in touch with you within... Um, within the next couple of days, usually within 24 hours, just to tell you how you can claim your prize. So um, thanks very much for, uh, for, for being here for that there. Now, of course, everyone is a winner just for being here today to, uh, to listen to, to Justin and Veronica, but you can also be a winner in a, a more sort of, you know, physical way uh, by joining us on the next Boris Effects live live stream which is coming up soon. When? Well, the easy answer to that is to head over to BorisEffects.com where you'll be up to date with all of the uh, the news and you'll be able to download free trial versions of all of the software you've seen today, plus hours and hours of free tutorials as well. The best way though, if you wanna keep up to date with what's happening in the world of, of Boris Effects videos is to just be a YouTube subscriber. So um, it came to my attention, that a lot of people who watch these aren't subscribers. Uh, shame on you all. Um, so hit that button now. If you've enjoyed the stream, hit the like button as well, just to let us know that this is the type of thing that we should be doing more of in the future. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, and I wanna say thank you again to all of our guests, Justin Graham, Veronica Hernandez, uh, Ross Shane and Marco Paolini. I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us today. If you do have any more questions, leave them in the comments. But for now, my name is Ben Brownlee, and I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.